Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fifth installment of Top Crop Managers webinar series. My name is Janin Belbeck, and I'm the Associate Editor for Top Crop Manager. I'm joined today by Bill May, Crop Management Agronomist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Indian Head, Saskatchewan. Uh, today, during our free 60-minute session, Bill will be talking about updates on his special crop sequencing study. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees and registrants approximately 24 hours after our live broadcast. You will receive an email with the link. This webinar has been approved for half a credit in nutrient management and a half credit in crop management for certified crop advisors. Further instruction for submissions will follow the presentation. The, schedule is, the session is scheduled to run for approximately 60 minutes. Bill will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, at which point we will start the Q&A period. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the questions tab found on the right-hand side of your screen. So without further ado, I'll let Bill take it away. Hi, um, I'd like to th thank uh, Top Crop Manager for uh, asking me to give this presentation. So I'm going to talk about some of our crop sequencing and rotation work that is going on here, uh, centered out of Indian Head, Saskatchewan. Um, we have a crop sequence project uh, that we uh, initiated a couple of years ago, and we're just getting the data in uh, as we speak on our second year. So with our crop sequencing, we have eight crops, hemp, wheat, oat, canola, pea, canary seed, quinoa, and coriander. And uh, what we do is all eight crops are seeded in strips in the first year, and then they're seeded perpendicular in the second year. So it's gonna look sort of like this. In year A, we seed the wheat down the row uh, in a block and oats, canola, and so forth. And then in year B, we seed wheat across each of the stubbles, wheat, oat, canola, pea, canary seed, hemp, quinoa, and coriander. So that gives us, uh, ends up with being a very big trial because this is just one rep and you can see it's 104 feet by 400 feet uh, when we're all done and said, said and done. So this is what year A would look like. Right in front of us, we have hemp. So this is a big block of hemp. Uh, this looks like peas, and you can pick out hemp over there as well. And the next year we will seed the other way. So this year we seeded that way for our block of hemp. Next year we'll take wheat and we'll seed this way, all the way across, through the pathway, onto the next block, and so on and so forth. And so this is canary seed. And if you look, you can see we seed it across. This looks like this is a, a cereal stubble or maybe pea stubble in there. And you can see there's this little line there. That's the break between, that's where the pathway was. And then we have another block farther on. That is the next stubble type. And this is a slope with coriander. So you can see the break a lot e easier in this picture. You can see this is one stubble, then the next stubble and so forth, all the way down to the end, we go across eight stubbles, all eight stubbles. So uh, the locations for this research are Swift Current, Saskatoon, Indian Head and Melfort. So Saskatchewan locations. In starting next year, we're going to, I'm joining another project with crop sequencing with a similar number of uh, crops with three locations in Alberta and the one in Indian Head. So we'll actually build quite a big data set on crop sequencing by the time everything's all said and done. The funding is fairly diverse. We have funding from the government of Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan Wheat Development Commission, the Western Grains Research Foundation, the Canary Seed Development Commission, Prairie Oat Growers Association, and of course, Agriculture and Agri Food Canada. So this is the basic agronomy we used, uh, the crops and then the varieties that we specified, uh, the seeding rates we looked at. 
one thing you should note, and then uh, what we thought would be our field emergence after we adjusted for germination, we still have to adjust for what we think our uh, mortality is going to be. One thing you should note is that we used 80 kilograms per hectare of N in this study for every uh, crop except peas. So crops like canola and hemp would like a little bit more N to optimize yield and so probably would wheat. Roats, that's probably enough. Uh, we don't know, coriander, it's probably too much. Quinoa is probably not enough and canary seed is probably too much. Uh, but we did that because uh, if we varied the end rate amongst all the crops, we wouldn't be able to pick out the end benefit from peas uh, as a stubble crop. And so with a little bit less end than we needed for some of the crops, we should be able to, uh, if their pea stubble provides an end benefit, because we don't have, we're not using as much end as the crop would desire, we should pick that up as part of the uh, benefit of growing the crop on a pea stubble. So here we have uh, the plant density of the harvested crops in Indian Head in 2016. On this side, we have the stubbles. So this is the first year crop, and this is the second year crop. So when we look, I've got canary seed uh, highlighted here. So this is canary seed, the plant density on the wheat stubble, the oat stubble, the canola stubble, the pea stubble on the canary seed stubble. So that's canary on canary, hemp and uh, quinoa and coriander. And then when we look across the other way, so if you wanna look this way and you'd say, okay, this is the impact of canary stubble. So you'd look and you'd say, okay, well, the wheat on wheat really suffered uh, canary, Wheat seeded on canary wasn't too bad, uh, all things considered. Um, oat on canary, uh, pretty good. Looks like at this site in this year, 2000, in 2016, the cereals really did not like going on that wheat stubble. Um, but if you look at canola, it did like going on the wheat stubble and it didn't particularly like the canary seed uh, stubble. So what we'll find is, as you look through this, there's gonna be some variation from year to year. So this is swift current, um, and this is the plant density again. And this time I highlighted uh, what we would expect, especially in yield, as the uh, probably the lowest uh, responses. So that's wheat on wheat, we expect disease, and because it's the same crop, we quite often expect that to be our lowest. So oat on oat, canola on canola, pea on pea, uh, canary on canary, hemp on hemp. And you can see this is one of the crops where actually in the plant density, uh, hemp on hemp suffered at uh, swift current. Uh, quinoa suffered at some, sub some stubbles. Uh, you can see that it liked the oat stubble and the canary seed stubble, uh, and it really did not like hemp stubble or pea stubble or the canola stubble very well. Uh, one thing to note is with the large amount of variation in here, we have to do some work before we get our stats down so that I can talk about statistical differences uh, with a lot of clarity. You notice, you'll quite often notice that if you grow coriander on coriander, you'll get a higher plant density and that's because of all the volunteer coriander from the previous year that we get. So then when we look at uh, plant density at Saskatoon in 2016, um, you can see that hemp on hemp did quite well here. So you can see between the two site years, the hemp on hemp did quite different. And that's why we need uh, more than one site year of data uh, when we're dealing with this uh, uh, this kind of research, because the environmental conditions at the individual site will affect, and how well the crop established, of course, and how 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 uh, vigorous it was during the growing season also has an impact. Um, yeah. So, uh, Indian Head 2017. This is what uh, coriander looked like when we established it on broadleaf stubble. Lots of times when uh, folks are talking about some of these weaker broadleaf crops, 
They like to have a tilled soil with nice snow uh, residue cover and nice uniform. And perhaps that's because we've been dealing with uh, excess moisture a lot in, in our cropping system, at least out here in the West. Uh, but in 2017, there was plenty of moisture in the soil, but we had windy conditions after seeding and absolutely no rain until into June. And so these, uh, uh, the plants, broadleaf plants had to emerge uh, under harsher conditions, even though they had soil moisture. And then they had to uh, deal with uh, having to grow roots into and keep up with the soil moisture as it uh, was depleted of the soil surface and uh, and grow. And so this is what it looks in broadleaf stubble at Indian Head in 2017. And there's what it looks like on cereal stubble. So you can see that when we have dry conditions, even when we have lots of moisture, our soil profile was full. Uh, lots of moisture in the spring. If we, when we're in Western Canada, we have these dry conditions. Uh, all of a sudden the cereal stubble really does shine for a lot of these uh, weaker uh, establishment broadleaf crops uh, that we deal with out here. Uh, so this is the plant density at, at Indian Head in 2017. So if you look at the coriander, you can see the coriander really like that tall wheat stubble it was you know 10 inches high. The canary seed was uh, even a little bit higher because we had to use a uh, stripper header to get it out of the field because of the wet conditions that fall. And uh, so you can see that, you know, the, the plant density was 46, 45 and 43 in the, the uh, cereal stubbles. And then in the canola, it was 22, 28, 11 on the hemp, 20 on the quinoa and 30 on the coriander. Now, if you look at a stronger uh, broadleaf crop, uh, canola uh, still preferred the wheat, oat, and 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 canary seed, but it also did well on everything except the canola on canola and the canola on hemp. So a little bit stronger broadleaf crop, a little bit more potential to uh, survive those dry conditions uh, in that stubble. But nevertheless, uh, when we're hitting these dry conditions, it, uh, stubble, uh, standing stubble really does help uh, preserve seedlings and uh, help them to turn into healthy plants. So this is the grain yield at Indian Head in 2016. As you can see, I highlighted a couple things here. So if you look on wheat on wheat, uh, not a big reduction in uh, seed yield. And that is actually quite common. I think it's because wheat's been bred so long and for long periods of time, it was a, a, a main crop that was growing after each other. And so with the breeding uh, system we've had, we've developed wheat cultivars that are fairly stable on wheat stubble. Oat at this location, yeah, I think there was a little bit of penalty to be on, on uh, oat stubble. And compared to the hemp, quinoa, and uh, stubble, the canola, it did look, it doesn't look so hot this location. A little bit of a yield penalty there for canola on canola, and then P on P took a big hit, only 1,100 compared to some of the others. So at this site year, P was very sensitive. Uh, these are high moisture years, and so that's where you expect P to be the most extent. Uh, sensitive on uh, pea stubble because of the disease issues that uh, are more prevalent under wet soil conditions. The canary seed certainly didn't like being grown on canary seed stubble here. Uh, a little bit, the hemp really, it wasn't too big a deal. And the coriander on coriander that year, yields were very low because of blossom blight. That's probably the biggest issue we deal with in coriander uh, in wet years. Now, if you look at do we get any end benefit from the peas in this year? Uh, probably a little bit in the wheat, maybe. Uh, not really, not statistically different. But on the uh, on the oat stubble, well, it wasn't better than uh, the quinoa or hemp stubble. So we really can't say there's an end benefit there. 
uh maybe a little bit of one here on the canola but really not decisive and not on the canary seed which we wouldn't expect it to be because it's not terribly responsive the hemp a little bit of a benefit and that's not a surprise because hemp is really does like its nitrogen in the coriander maybe a little bit of a benefit but not really uh one not really something i would consider that that response there is a n response when we look at swift current in 2016 we can see the wheat did reasonably well on wheat stubble as well as it did on oat stubble uh, but not as well as it did on pea stubble and the canary seed and coriander hemp stubble i said had a little bit so with these three like this then that's probably a broadleaf response not a nitrogen response we look at oats though uh again it's similar to hemp so can't really say hey that was an n response there uh the canola perhaps we can say that's an n response or suspect that that's an n response because it's 200 uh higher than uh than the hemp so there there may be some end benefit there and uh but if we look at the canary seed we wouldn't expect to see a benefit the hemp is picking up that end response uh and i probably would be fairly confident in saying that that's a that's an end benefit there in the hemp and then the quinoa yields and coriander yields were very low so it's hard to be specific there uh saskatoon um you can see that the wheat did reasonably well on itself the oat did not this site it really suffered um and again the canola uh didn't like the canary seed but it also wasn't very thrilled on its own stubble compared to a couple others but uh and the end response that we can see here uh not in oats because we've got quinoa there but you can see in the canola we've got a fairly strong response there uh to the peace double at this site year data uh the canary seed again not particularly happy on the peace double uh and you can see that the hemp did good but there doesn't seem to be an n response there because it did well on all the different stubble types there and the coriander uh well actually it did best on itself maybe because it the volunteers thickened it up the stand a little bit more and the disease issues it was a dry dry year that uh, dry in 2016 in saskatoon indian head in 2017 so you remember that uh when we talked about this before with the different stubbles uh so you can see coriander uh, we'll just go over here for a second. This coriander with a high plant density, strong survival on the cereal stubbles compared to the canola where it was really weak. And the pea and then the canary seed is up here higher. So other in wet situations, we've had some yield drag with canary seed. But in a dry uh, site year like this, uh, we don't see that uh, yield drag at all at canary seed at this site year of data. And that's why we're going to need lots of uh, all 12 site years of data to come some good conclusions uh wheat on wheat yeah not not too good uh but the wheat on canola actually looks worse at this site year uh, maybe a little bit of a bump from the peas but not a nitrogen bump because the canary seed is very similar uh when with the oats lower site yield here definitely not a uh a yield response to the peas the canola uh, maybe a little bit of one you can see the canola did not like being on the canola that's fairly heavy hit to grow canola on canola and uh in this year because it was dry you see we don't have as big a hit with the peas on peas simply because it's a a much drier year and the, we don't have that yield hit with the canary on canary again because it's a drier year um, and it certainly wasn't fond of the pea stubble there as well. Uh, the hemp, well, the hemp did as well on the on the canary seed and the it did better, you know, on the oat and wheat stubble. So definitely not a pea response there. 
and definitely, I mean, an end response there, and definitely not an end response at the coriander as well. So you can see that as we move from site year to site year, we get slightly different differences. And uh, yeah, there's the two the the stubbles I talked about earlier, and you can see uh, the benefit of uh, having that establishment. Uh, good establishment in the earlier when you're uh, under those stressful conditions and you're trying to maintain as much moisture in the soil profile as you can. So problems, well, paperwork to include hemp in a trial is a lot large cost and time and effort. Uh, we're having trouble with our quinoa having uh, adaptive material for all of our locations and we're facing a fair bit of insect pressure in our quinoa, maybe because it's small plots. All the ligus moves out of the swath canola into our quinoa plots. And coriander uh, blossom blight is definitely a major issue that we're dealing with. So uh, some conclusions, dry conditions after seeding uh, gave cereal stubbles an advantage over broadleaf stubbles. P supplied extra N in some cases. We'll see how consistent that is and for what crops uh, benefited the most. And, uh, oh, that should be growing, not crowing. <laughs> Usually a penalty for growing a crop on its own stubble. Sorry about that. Uh, and really, we're just scraping the surface so far uh, in, uh, in this research trial. We have a long ways to go. Uh, so the next trial I want to talk about is frequency of pulses in rotations. Uh, Dr. Guy Lafon had a pea frequency st uh, study that uh, just had wheat and peas in the rotation because when he started it in our area, wheat uh, and a pea uh, piece came in. And so wheat was the major crop in the rotation. Canola hadn't really entered the uh, our region for production at that point in time. And he ran it approximately for nine years with no major problems. And then the whole system collapsed, the whole cropping system collapsed. And I started a new study with Dr. Gann, uh, who's at Swift Current, looking at pulse frequency in more diverse rotations than Dr. LaFond had. And just as we got this study going, we found out that the reason the, the study Lafond, uh, Dr. Lafond ran was from Ephanomyces. We, we had a good strong idea it was root disease, but Ephanomyces had finally established in, in that field and had taken over. And so it's kind of silly in some one respect to be running a trial with this intensity of pulses in it. On the other hand, uh, I didn't know at the time uh, about how what the disease complex was. And third, uh, it's great because if I can collapse the uh, these rotations uh, that have higher level of peas from uh, a disease, then I can monitor how hard it is to bring uh, them back uh, to where we can uh, easily uh, use a, a pea or a lentil in this rotation. Um, after we've built up the root rot diseases in the plot. So not something I recommend, but it's going to happen to some people and we need to know, uh, besides just not growing peas and lentils for eight years, is 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 there a way of bringing uh, the peas and lentils or another pulse into the rotation? So anyways, what we started with is our gold standard, a wheat oil seed, so a cereal oil seed, cereal pulse. In this case, it's wheat, canola, oat, pea. And our second rotation, we added uh, two peas. So we took out the canola and we went wheat, pea, oat, pea. Um, and so therefore we have two years of pulses. We have a pulse every second year. We actually have peas every second year. And then we went, well, people like to have canola. So what happens if we go wheat, pea, canola, pea? So we have a canola break between the two pre pea crops instead of an oat break. Uh, Will that affect disease intensity on this pea crop? And this one as well, after we go through several cycles of this rotation. 
The fourth rotation is a wheat pea lentil pea. So this is this rotation I almost expected to have already collapsed and it hasn't. Uh, you know, very high three years of, of, of pulses out of four. So we should, and they're all uh, susceptible to the same root rot diseases. So we should be able to hammer those plots, uh, you know, into a, a problem, but we haven't yet. So we'll keep going. Uh, in rotation five, we have wheat, lentil, oat, and pea. So uh, we've, we've uh, instead of just peas, we have a lentil and pea, and we have an oat break. So then this rotation is directly comparable to this one. We just have peas instead of, a, we have a lentil instead of a pea. And then because canola is growing so frequently nowadays, we have a rotation that also has canola every second year. So we can compare the yield of this canola when it's growing every second year to this canola when it's growing every fourth year. And these are four-year rotations. Uh, we have in our cropping system, we started and we have gone through this rotation once. And now we've gone through two years and this spring we'll be starting our third year of the rotation. So in after 2019, we'll have completed two full cycles of this rotation. And so the difference between a rotation is you have a crop sequence that you repeat several times, where with a crop sequence, you only do it once. And that's how I define the difference between a crop sequence and a rotation. Funding from this came from SAS Pulse Growers and of course, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, who I work for. So when we look at the grain yield of P in rotation in 2015, uh, one thing jumped out was that actually the wheat, lentil, oat, pea did the best in that specific year. Um, and I'll explain the colors to you. Uh, the red has pea in once every four years. The green has pea just once, but canola twice. So if if we have a high level of canola, how does that affect our pea yields? And then this one has, the blues have two pulses, whether it's peas or lentils, every two out of four years. And then the, the uh, purple, it's three pulses, three out of four years for pulses. Um, two of those years are peas. So you can see that in that year, these two uh, rotations, happen to have the lowest uh, grain yield on a bushels per acre basis. But if we go to 2016, we can see that those two uh, rotations, the wheat uh, pea canola pea and the wheat pea wheat pea uh, tend to be quite low. But this wheat lentil oat pea still did relatively best. I was glad to see that our gold standard that we think is the best actually did quite well in that year, and uh, but we're not, uh, you know, and these were 2015, 16 were wet years, so we're starting to see some disease buildup in there. But uh, then we go to 2017, which was dry. Uh, we only had uh, a couple inches of rain in June, and you can see, yes, the the gold standard did fairly well, but in that dry year we have the three pulse rotations coming up to the, the four and actually the rotation with the two canolas going down. So um, again, you can see that the environment is playing a, uh, a large impact on the results we're seeing. And I don't know um, how long uh, these rotations will stand up. Uh, if we go into a dry cycle, they'll probably stand up longer. We're monitoring the root diseases. We had two wet years and it was starting to hit them. If Maybe if we'd had a third, it, it would have really made itself present, but it hasn't. So we'll have to see how long we have to go. And the other thing to remember is this is on a loam soil. It's an Edgley Cudworth uh, loam uh, where Dr. LaFon's study was on a heavy clay, and that may also have an impact on how fast uh, 
the root diseases uh, take effect and how dominant they are in the soil. So that's another question that uh, we need to answer. These are looking at the canola part of the rotations. So uh, the orange has one canola and one pea. The green have canola, two canolas, and the blue has two pulses. So in this one, it's the canola after the peas, and in this one, it's the canola after the wheat. And over here, it's canola after wheat, but of course, we have the peas only once. And over here, we have two peas in the rotation with canola after it. In 2015, uh, there was a slight benefit to the two pulse rotation, uh, but the reversed in 2016. Um, and in 2017, a uh, bit of a mixed match, but again, uh, over the last couple of years anyways, this rotation has uh, stood up the best over over those, even in a dry year and in, in this dry year, 2017 and the wet year of 2016. So it may, it seems to be the most consistent, but that just might be because I'm imagine well because of my preference for that, and we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, when we look at wheat in the rotation, um, it's interesting that uh, again this uh, this two p row two p's in the rotation, the wheat uh, did fairly well in 2015. That whole rotation did well in that year, uh, with uh, the pea oat pea wheat and the lentil oat pea wheat uh, being significantly lower. So, you know, it's hard to imagine uh, how the crop in here, the oat canola and the oat lentil are making that big a difference. But that was just one year data. When we look in 2016, uh, we're not seeing a significant impact, but this three pulse rotation is certainly holding its own in there. Uh, and these ones have just switched their order around a little bit, not statistically. And then in the dry year of 2017, uh, we had enough moisture that we maintained our, our wheat yields in here quite, uh, quite well. And uh, again, no statistical impact of the other rotations on wheat, which it doesn't surprise me. Um, to a large extent, because I think wheat is has been growing and is growing because of its stability uh, when it is over environmental conditions and uh, previous crops as well. I think so. Conclusion so far in this study is that there's lots of variation among the years. Uh, the uh, wheat canola oat pea type rotation appears to be the most consistent up to this point, but I will say that I'm biased towards that because I think it's probably a better type of rotation and I uh, may just be wishful thinking. We'll see what happens over the long term. Uh, when, uh, when a question I have is when will root disease build up enough to do in the pulses, in the pulse, in these rotations, uh, we are on a loam soil, not a heavy clay and that may make a big difference on how long these uh, types of rotations are sustainable. I don't know. Um, and I would not suggest that producers run the risks I'm running in these rotations. Basically, I'm trying to see if I can fall on my face and then trying to see if we can recover so that other people don't have to fall on their face. And if they do, uh, can you recover? And those are kind of the issues that we're dealing with in that study. We're also looking at weed uh, movement in there. We have some data on root disease uh, development and numbers and microflora in there. And we're also monitoring, uh, we're also monitoring organic matter, uh, soil carbon, those sorts of features as well. And we also are monitoring salinity at this site because there is a little bit of salinity in some points that move around and come up and down uh, depending on wet and dry years. 
Uh, just uh, to conclude here, this is our long-term rotation, and I pulled a bit of data together because I'm starting to look at these uh, for another paper. And this study was started in 1958 or 56, I think. And this is a summary of the yield data. Um, so this is continuous wheat here with no fertilizer. This is the continuous wheat with fertilizer. And I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get the other axis up. This is the fertilizer rates that were used over those same periods. So it's about 22, uh, then 85, and then we're up to about 95. It varies, of course, from year to year because we take the residual amount of N in the soil. But I just wanted to show you this. This is basically a uh, no fertilizer. So this receives P every year as well as the N. This receives no N, no P. So since 1950s, the yield has gone up and down. And you can see that uh, 2016 was a very high year, yielding year. 2015 wasn't, so you could kind of average these to compare with these, which are averages. But on the whole, uh, in this uh, almost organic system, except, uh, well, it's no fertilizer. So we use herbicides and it's no-till. So we switched to no-till between 84 and 2003, about 92. Um, but uh, so we use herbicides and uh, some wheat midge control and so on and so forth. So the only difference between this and this is fertilizer. And you can see the fertilizer came up quite a bit, but on average, you know, when they were using that really low rate of 22, uh, the yields did came come down a bit later and we had to deal with a bit of wheat all, take all, but that's out of the system now with these continuous wheats. And you can see the yields built up a little bit, but it really didn't change too much. But you can see that over the same period of time, the fertilizer has gone up a little bit, but our yield potential in our farming system in uh, this area has certainly uh, increased quite substantially uh, as we've improved the agronomics of our farming system. So uh, uh, I just thought I'd throw that little tidbit in. Um, there's a lot more data there that I'll try and get together. And uh, I hope you found this talk informative. Perfect, thank you, Bill. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions for Bill to um, type them into um, the panel on the right hand side of your screen. Um, I have a couple questions here, Bill. Um, sorry if they're um, reiterating maybe what you covered, but I think everyone likes to kind of get a nice review at the end of the presentation. Um, so according to your data, um, what crop sequence combinations look the absolute worst to you? Uh, okay, so on the whole, uh, the crop sequences that I think are the riskiest, if we go all the way back, uh, let's see, I think these ones I highlighted in yellow, except for wheat, are often the riskiest combinations. So canola and canola is fairly risky you can expect a yield decrease, although you can see that canola and hemp at that site year uh, didn't do it, did worse or similar. But normally, especially in wetter conditions, and I think the wetter it is, uh, the, the more susceptible you are to trouble when you put uh, uh, the same crop on top of seeded into its own stubble. And that's why it's just, it's not a practice people use, it's not a uh, practice people usually use, but uh, okay. that's the one that people gotta be the most careful of, I would say. Perfect. Plus you start to build up disease and uh, insect pressure and you're right. using the same herbicide. So herbicide uh, weed uh, resistance can be increased as well. Perfect. Um, someone's wondering if you plan to use um, soybeans as a crop in rotation for any of your future studies. Yes, the next uh, crop sequencing experiment will have soybeans in it, at least at Indian Head. Perfect. Um, 
how so when regards to with regards to stubble um how does the environment change the benefits of a stubble so um in dry years a taller stubble protects the not only the moisture in the soil uh, before seeding but it also protects the seedlings after emergence and prevents uh reduces desiccation and uh, uh so it gives those plants uh acts keeps the so moisture closer to the surface and more moisture close to the surface until those plants are well established have a well established rooting system uh to access the moisture perfect um, and then when we're talking about um, your high intensity pulse rotation, um, how long would those pulse rotations survive? Um, again, you're building up that um, insect and disease pressure with those high, in in high intensity um, rotations. Um, how long would you expect to see those last? Uh, I'm kind of surprised they've lasted as long as they have. I, I kind of expected them to start we we're starting to pick up some visual differences and we're starting to have some impacts but uh, then we had dr a dry year and that backed off the impacts quite a bit and we're heading into another dry year so uh, with the P diseases if you have a dry spring um, without a lot of rainfall and the peas get well established and out of the ground before uh, you get a lot of heavy pounding rains, uh, or if you don't get heavy pounding rains, then the, the peas are much better off at handling diseases and the soil blowing diseases as well. Um, it They just like to come out of the soil in a dry environment and they really do thrive if they have, you know, three or four weeks after they come out without any heavy rains, uh, they're they're better off. Uh, if they're just coming out of the soil and you get an inch rain with pounding rain, uh, that's going to set your peas back. So um, there's that environmental conditions as well that affect peas, but the soil diseases, uh, I kind of expected to see the bigger impact, but we're in a loam soil and a phanomyces can swim in, move around in, in the between the soil pores when there's water in the soil pores and so in a heavy clay it may we may hold on to those uh that water and those soil pores may be uh filled for a longer period of the growing season even in a normal year uh and in in a wet year it really does uh hold a lot of washed water where a loam there's a little bit of a slope in here there's some depressional areas uh perhaps that uh is a a big difference. Perfect. Um, so just before we um, end today, um, I'd like to once again say that this webinar has been approved for continuing education credits. Those are CCA Certified Crop Advisor credits. Um, you can earn a half credit in both crop and nutrient management for attending today. Please email your first and last name as well as your CCA certification number to webinars at annexweb.com. Uh, these instructions will also be found in our follow-up email um, which will also hold the recording of the webinar. Uh, your credits should be processed within the next couple of weeks uh, and you should see our follow-up email in your inbox within the next 24 hours or so. Um, so Bill I'd like to once again thank you uh, for presenting today. Um, I'm sure we'll hear more about um, your future work in issues of Top Crop Manager. Um, just a reminder for everyone, we're back April 10th at the same time, 1 p.m. Central, to discuss soybean cyst nematode updates with Albert Tenuta. Uh, we hope to see everyone then. So thanks, guys. Have a good day.